Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to do three things this morning. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the history of a rather unusual model, the 2050 Pathways Calculator, which was built by the Department of Energy and Climate Change in the UK um, and has been adapted by others for their own circumstances. Uh, We've used this model in the UK and elsewhere to understand the implications of the decisions we're making now about our energy system. Um, uh, Second, I'll show you the model itself um, and encourage you to uh, look it up and play around with it yourselves. Um, And I'll also, thirdly, tell you a bit about how we and others have used the model. Um, I'd be delighted if you're inspired to build your own version of our model. Uh, this is an advert we found. Um, it's, it's 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, it's from a, a, a US energy company that's now integrated in some other one. Um, I'll just say, it has a picture of some pristine looking glaciers. And the, the phrase is, each day Humboldt supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. I don't know whether this means, you know, look how far we've come in several decades, or look how far we haven't come. So there are two questions. Should we do anything about anthropogenic climate change? And if we should, what should we do? And those questions have caused a lot of arguments um, and made a lot of people unhappy. Mm. But in the UK, by 2009, we answered those questions. We decided that we should do something about anthropogenic climate change. And what we should do is reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So our target is, by 2050, the UK's greenhouse gas emissions will be uh, 20% of what they were in 1990. Okay, so the hard question is answered. The only question left is, how can we achieve this target that we've set out for ourselves? And... Uh, back in 2009, we set out to answer this question, and we assumed that, okay, the first two questions were very hard and very difficult to achieve consensus. This question of how we're going to meet our target, well, surely that has a straightforward, objective answer we could all agree on. Um, and there was actually quite a remarkable agreement. I mean, from large multinational corporations to households, from government departments to small businesses. Um, The answer to the question, how can we achieve a significant reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions, was the same. Namely, it's very, very hard for me to do anything, someone else will have to do something. Okay, so perhaps consensus wasn't as easy as we thought. Just to say, it's... I mean, your own situation will be different, but um, in the UK there are other motivations to consider the decisions we're making now and the implications for the future. Um, So the UK has, in the last few years, become a net importer of gas. We used to be a net exporter. Uh, Some of our power stations are ageing. The grids need to be updated. Um, People are very worried about rising energy bills. So there there are multiple reasons why we're worried about the future and what we can do about it. Okay, what can be done? Well, um, some people are in favour of wind power. Actually, quite a lot of people in the UK are in favour of wind power. Um, It produces low carbon, sustainable electricity. The problem is that in the UK, a lot of people Um, including some of those who are in favour of wind power, are not in favour of wind power built near where they live. Okay, so there are problems with this approach. Okay, so let's build the wind power a long way away from where everyone lives. These are wind turbines um, in the North Sea. So that's a good idea, and in fact there are good reasons to build wind turbines offshore, Um, which is that the wind is more consistent out there. 
However, it turns out that if you build a large piece of metal machinery um, in the middle of um, a harsh salt water environment, a long way away from roads, it costs lots of money. And some people, some of the same people who are, in favor, who are not in favour of wind power near where they live, are also not in favour of spending unnecessarily large sums of money. I'm not saying that's my opinion, I'm saying that's what some people say. Okay, great, so what about solar power? We can put those on roofs, where they don't spoil anyone's view. Um, they're close by, so we can service them. Um, many people in the UK are in favour of solar power. Unfortunately, I have it on good, ev on good anecdotal evidence that it's not very sunny in the UK compared to many places in the world. This, the central figure is our current Prime Minister, David Cameron, um, and he is, uh, this is taken this week, um, and it's, uh, it's been raining a lot, and lots, large parts of the country are flooded, so uh, Mr. Cameron is visiting those parts. The problem is, oops, sorry, The problem is, as I'm sure you're aware, that if you don't, if you can't quantify this debate, if you don't have a numerical basis to discuss the issues, the argument just goes round in circles. Let's have wind, no, it's too expensive, let's have nuclear, well we don't like nuclear power. The argument just goes round. It's also true that just adding numbers to the, to the debate doesn't always help. So you often see this kind of statement. So this, this particular quote is from um, uh, Renewable UK, who are a renewables industry association. And they say, um, a single 2.5 megawatt wind turbine can generate enough electricity to make 230 million cups of tea. Uh, you often see this, this kind of thing. Okay, that's a lot of cups of tea. But is it a lot of electricity? I don't know. I don't know. Is that a lot? Is that a little? It's, 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 it's a numerical answer, and it's right. I'm sure it's right. But it doesn't help us decide whether wind turbines are a good idea or not, compared to the other trade-offs we're having to make. So, oh, and you see similar things. So, for instance, um, uh, a new nuclear reactor is being built in the UK, the first one for a long time, a very big one. And um, we've said that it will generate enough electricity to power six million homes. Okay, that sounds like a lot of electricity too. But, you know, I don't, just from that statement, I don't know how many homes are there. Is six million of all of our homes, or only a fraction? I don't know how much energy we use as electricity as opposed to other forms of energy. I don't know how much electricity is used in homes as opposed to the other places we use it. So, it seems that to have a proper energy literate debate, you need two things to happen. The first thing is that you need to quantify what you're talking about, whether it's energy or cost. And the second thing is, the first is not enough, the second thing is you need to be able to put these numbers in context. You have to bring all the different sides of the argument together in a way where you can compare the numbers. Um, sometimes we say we have to make the argument add up. So, that's where we were. Luckily, someone told us how to make the argument add up. This is um, Professor David Mackay, who uh, is now currently the Chief Science Advisor to my department, the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, and just before he came to DEC, he wrote a book, which you've probably seen. So this is his book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Or, to give it its proper title, I'm going to try this. Trinostna energia bez razgratega ozracia. So it's been translated into Slovenian. Um, and David's book was, I mean, actually, it was remarkable. When you look back, you think what he did was just obvious. But it, for some reason, it wasn't obvious at the time. Um, what he did was chapter by chapter, he went through every single part of the UK's energy system and just asked the question, how much energy could we generate from sustainable sources? And how much energy do we need? 
in transport, in heating, in industry, from wind power, from wave power, from uh, solar thermal, from geothermal, from nuclear. Just ask all those questions. And each chapter answered that question numerically in a way that made it comparable with every other chapter using little physics-based, back-of-the-envelope, really quite simple calculations, but based on you know, evidence that you source. It sounds, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds, well, of course that's what you would do. But somehow it hadn't been done. And the book was remarkable. And not everyone agreed with his conclusions, but pretty much everyone agreed that that was the right way to go about trying to answer the question. Okay. So that's where we were in 2009. Um, but we wanted to go further. So the question for us is not just can the UK live on sustainable energy, but what are our choices? What are the options available to us? What are the different possibilities for the future? Um, so the book is a static view of the world as it is, but because of our legal targets, we were concerned with the world in 2050, and also with how we're going to get there. Uh, I mean, it seems a long way off, but if you look at the lifetimes of the... Uh, the infrastructure needed, it's not a long time, actually. So, what we wanted was a way to take Professor Mackay's book and, and make it interactive, <coughs> so that, that a user, a reader of his book, if you like, could make different choices and see what their implications were. So, we, we wanted to build a model. Um, and it's that model that I'd like to show you. But before I do that, I just want to say a word about models. Because um, the thing is, you know, my, my department already has models. We, have, I mean, we use a lot of modeling, a lot of numerical modeling in our work. We have to do so, quite rightly. Um, so we have uh, detailed models of every individual policy that is made, or individual sectors. But of course, those models are about a particular sector and don't understand how the whole thing fits together. Um, we do have a, a whole system energy model, which we call UEP, um, which is used to make uh, forecasts of the next 10, 20 years about what we think will happen if our policies are successful. Um, but it doesn't go up to 2050. I mean, in some sense, it's impossible to predict 2050. I mean, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, the the uh, advertisement we saw at the beginning, who would have thought when they wrote that advertisement they would be sitting here today laughing at what they were thinking? Um, and, and also, crucially, a lot of our models are, well, they're quite complicated. And the answer is there, but it's hard to understand why. Why is the model telling it? what it's telling us. And then we also use um, uh, other large optimizing models built by the international community. Um, some of them we use ourselves, some of them we uh, employ consultants to uh, run them all for us. But they're very complex. And, you know, they, they, they may well be right, but it's hard to trust complexity. That's hard for us to understand the implications of uncertainty in these models. And, and they're not easy to use. So we wanted a model that tried to address these shortcomings as we saw it. Uh, and that was the 2050 model. Sorry, so this is how I imagine most models are. They're sort of, it's a bit like the Oracle of Delphi. You know, there's some large thing, and then there are people whose job is to interpret the output of the model for you. But we wanted to connect the user of the model with the model directly. Okay, so we built a model. What made it different? I'll show you the model in a second. Well, a number of things made it different, actually. The first difference was that nobody is going to agree a single unique uh, future trajectory for any sector of the UK's energy system. I mean, there's no way we're going to get agreement on that. The government can say what its preferred option is, and other people can say what they think, but no one's going to agree what this happened. So we said, fine, 
Actually, that's okay. We don't mind if you don't agree, as long as we're all, as long as we're all arguing about the same kind of thing and not about different things. So for every sector of the UK, we had an extremely wide-ranging public engagement, and we said, let's just agree what the options are and how to, how to write down what those options are. Um, um, and I'll come back to talk a bit more about how we did that, because it, it turned out to be very useful. Um, we, uh, very unusually, for, for governments anywhere, even in the UK, is we were completely open and transparent about our modelling process. So during modelling development, we engaged externally. Um, um, I'll tell you a bit more about that. And then when we built the model, we published it, all of it, everything, and we asked people to give us feedback on the model. And I don't know if any of you are modelers, are any of you modelers? But it is really hard to receive criticism of your model. People would write in and say, you know, there's a mistake. <laughs> there's a mistake here, you've got it wrong. And, and you think, ah, but, but we did. And we said, thank you very much, you're absolutely right. We fixed it. Um, and that, that, that was, I think that was very different and very unusual, but it really brought us credibility in this model. Um, we, we built the model in Excel because everyone's got Excel, and we published it and we shared it, and we tried to make it easy to use. Um, and we built other versions that were even easier to use. So we're really trying to get the model away from the high priests of modeling and into the hands of technically sophisticated but otherwise ordinary people. Um, and lastly, we, we didn't try to use the model to make predictions about what will happen. Because that's a fool's game. It's 2050. Who knows? I mean, yeah, who knows? What we try to do is say, okay, we're making decisions about what we might do. The question is, what are the implications of those decisions? So we made a model about implications more than about prediction. And that was the transparency as well. I mean, that's why the name. We chose the name quite deliberately. We called it a calculator. You know, it, it brings to mind a very simplistic you know, device whose sole function is to take a well-defined question and produce an answer. It's not a, an optimizing model, it's not a macroeconomic equilibrium model, it's just a calculator. So, let me just um, tell you a bit about the things that made it different. This is, let's take nuclear power. So the UK has a choice. Should we stop building nuclear power stations? Should we build some, a lot, an incredible amount. How do we get those choices into the calculator? Well, what we did was in almost all sectors, we, um, we picked four options, ranging from level one, uh, the user of the calculator doesn't care about climate change and just wants to continue as normal, or in this case, level one it meant uh, we just stopped building nuclear power stations. Level two, we, uh, we, we uh, have some level of effort that people would think a reasonable level of effort. Level three, very ambitious. Level four, the most we could plausibly and believably imagine that it's possible to do. Sometimes we call level four the, the moon landing option. Um, and that was to span the whole range. So anyone, whatever their Whatever their special interest, whatever they're coming from, we felt that anyone who's not completely insane would find their personal preference somewhere in that range. Um, and four was about right. It turns out you know you could be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, but it doesn't really matter to the implications. Um, so that's what we did, and we tried to ground that in reality. So the, the so the graph shows um, uh, uh, electricity generation from nuclear power. And that the horizontal axis is time from 1960 to 2050. And the, the lower black line shows the UK's um, historic nuclear power generation. And then the, um, the blue lines show our four chosen trajectories that are embedded in the calculator. So one just tails off, two builds some more, three very ambitious, four extremely ambitious. And I mean, let me just talk about level four for a minute. 
You know, why on earth do you put such an incredibly ambitious... I mean, just look at it, it's enormous. It says that by 2050, the UK will have as much nuclear power generation as the entire EU does currently. Why would we put such a large effort in? And the answer is because if we don't, somebody will feel shortchanged by the calculator. Somebody will think, no, 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 nuclear power is the answer. Your calculator didn't, didn't evaluate all possibilities. So we had to get these extreme versions in. Given that, is it even believable that we could do level four? Well, yes, it is. Because if you look at France, in the early 1980s, France built nuclear power stations at a very high rate, about the rate that we're suggesting for level four. Okay, we're saying you should sustain that for 20 years, but it's clearly possible because the French did it. So you can't say it's impossible, but you can say it's about the biggest extreme example you might imagine. So this is how we captured the map. Um, we also involved other people in our development. So uh, this was the original team. Um, and it wasn't just the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, we had uh, uh, people from uh, AECOM is a, a building efficiency um, commercial uh, uh, consultancy. National Grid, our electricity system owner and operator at the, the network. Um, uh, ADF, the French Energy Company. Um, UCL is uh, University College London University and Imperial as well. So we, we brought in lots of people into the team. That helped. Um, and we shared the model wildly. I, I cannot tell you how unusual this is. We, I mean, we just put it out there. You can go download it, everything. It, it, it's really unusual. And we got just overwhelming amount of interest from other organisations. I think because we been so open. So all these groups gave us feedback on what they thought of our model, which we then incorporated. Um, and um, we actually did a lot of work to make the model more accessible. So the original version was Excel. That's the, there's a screenshot at the top there. Um, but one of us, not me, um, turned it into a, 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 an internet, a web-based tool, which I'll show you. That's this one here. And we wrote um, a very simple game-like version called uh, My2050, um, which simplified all the choices and put some interactive graphics behind it. But underlying that was the real model. I mean, it's not, we didn't make it up, it's the real model that's just simplified. Um, so a lot of the general public gets into it through the, the My2050 version. Okay, let me show you the model. Let's see. And at this point, you should feel free to ask questions. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's safari gone. Yeah. Fantastic. So, if you search for 2050 Pathways Calculator, uh, there it is. Okay. So. It's the UK, remember. Um, I'll explain. At the top, the graphs show the output of the calculator as what happens between now and 2050 for the options the user has chosen. On the left, um, where are we using energy? For what purpose are we using energy? Uh, so we've got transport, heating and cooling, industry. In the middle, where is our energy coming from? The primary source of energy, natural gas, oil, coal, so on. And on the right, what are our emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, emissions from burning stuff, from international aviation, uh, agriculture, industrial processes, And the, the goal, if you, if you want a goal, it turned out to be really helpful to have a goal to get people to use the model. If you want a goal, the goal is get those emissions down in 2050 to 20% of their 1990 levels. That's that sort of the time. It turned out to be really helpful to have that incentive for people. 
And the way you do that is you make choices. So at the bottom, we've got uh, uh, about 40 different sectors covering all, everything in the UK that generates emissions and uses energy. Um, and there are choices at, at those levels one to four that I talked about earlier. On the left here is um, the demand side. On the middle is the supply side. Um, and on the right are um, uh, two ones that didn't really fit ever anywhere else. Um, so, for example, let's take nuclear power. So, here's level one, and it, it tells you what it means. No new nuclear power installed, estimated closure of final plant in 2035. Okay, that seems a bit silly. Let's build some nuclear power stations. Level two. 13 3 gigawatt power stations delivering 280 terawatt hours a year. That's by 2050. That's like a lot, actually, compared to what we have now. I think now we have about 10 gigawatts of nuclear power. So we're going to build 13 very large power stations. Okay, let me click that button. And off you go. And as you can see, the, where do we get our energy from? Nuclear fission. And the emissions have changed not really very much at all. Anyone like to suggest how we might get our emissions down? Any suggestions? What's your favourite decarbonisation option? Energy efficiency. Okay, where? For all sectors. Pick a sector. Buildings. 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 Very good. Buildings. Okay. So the buildings, we've got two options over here. Um, this is how warm do you want your home. Uh, just so you know, ooh, that's exciting. <laughs> the guy that wrote the web version of this is, is just amazing. His name is um, Dr. Tom Council. And um, it's absolutely lovely. So you can see that if you hover over that option, it switches through the options and the graphs change to show you what's going to happen. So I'm not even going to touch it. Um, so um, in the UK at the moment, most domestic heating is, uh, um, is through the burning of natural gas. Um, and so obviously, as you, as you go to level four, you're turning down the average temperature. So let me hold that. So, um, so level one, um, uh, it says that's what happens if, you, if people keep wanting to be warmer and warmer inside in the way that they have been doing over the last few decades. So imagine in 2050, um, people are setting their thermostat to 20 degrees Celsius. But, if we were going to be really austere, we might imagine turning down the thermostat to 16 degrees Celsius. Um, and that will, of course, use less gas. So let's do that. Hey, the emissions went down. But 16, that's pretty cold, actually, for most people. I mean, yeah, that's pretty cold. So maybe that was a bit too extreme. What about 70? I have my house at 70. So I think we can go to 70. I'm young. Yeah, if you're older, you probably want the house a bit warmer. Um, but, uh, but you said energy efficiency. So we can also look at home insulation. Now, um, in the UK, a lot of our housing stock is 100 years old, uh, built of brick. Um, it, it's not particularly well insulated. Um, so, but we might try and do better. So let's have a look. Level two. Uh, yeah. So those those descriptions are rather generic. Um, but we also wrote a little note on every sector. So if I click on the eye, um, we wrote these little notes on every sector behind them. Um, so it explains exactly what is what's really going on, you know, in real terms by the option. So level three, uh, new homes built to advanced energy standards, 18 million, we have about 26 homes in England, 18 million get loft insulation, 40 million get triple glazing, uh, uh, 6 million with solid wall insulation. Um, so many of the houses in the UK have um, walls that are, uh, you know, two two layers of brick thick with a gap in the middle. So with those, you can fill the gap with something insulated. Mm -hmm. But if your house like mine is just, you know, just a solid brick wall, you have to stick insulation on the outside or the inside, um, um, and that's quite hard for people to do. But you might imagine doing it. Okay. Uh, 
So let's try level three. And that helped a bit too. Well, we can keep going. Um, but the idea is, whatever, whatever interest group you're coming from, whatever particular approach to uh, 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 emissions reduction that you think is important, in the end, you have to make a choice everywhere. It's not enough to make a choice in only one place. You, you have to make a choice across the system and say how you want to make those trade-offs. Uh, we were really delighted, actually, in that um, we got a number of different groups to make their own set of system-wide decisions. Uh, so um, there are some interest groups in there, so Friends of the Earth, so, uh, um, an environmental uh, pressure group, Campaign to Protect Rural England, uh, National Grid, the energy system, uh, the transmission system owner and operator, all of them very kindly made their own set of options. Um, I'll just show you one, which is sort of the, it's the one that you get, it's the one that's close to what you get if you take a commonly used optimizing model and ask it to optimize, given what we know about costs. So, um, there you go, that meets the target. And we've learned some things. There are some level falls in there. There are some level falls. So we've learned a number of things straight away. You can meet our legally binding targets, which is lucky for us, um, but it's not, it's not easy. So that's our calculator. Um, I'll just show you two more things um, about the model we built. Um, by the way, all this code is available for reuse. You can download the underlying source code. Uh, I think it's under an open government license, which is fairly limited. Um, we also show, um, for people that are interested, um, we call this a Sankey diagram. So it shows, this is 2050, for that particular set of choices that I made. And it shows where the energy comes from and where it goes, which is nice. Um, and, Again, for us it was really important to make this all real. So it's easy to quote numbers. 100 terawatt hours here, 1,000 wind turbines there. But it's hard to say what it means exactly. So one of the ways in which we say what it means is um, you do a, do a map. So the thing about renewable energy is that, usually, is that almost all of it comes from the sun, which means that land area is, is your constraining factor. So we drew on a map of the UK, the land area that we are suggesting is used to produce renewable energy in the pathway that the user has chosen, so these areas are to scale. Um, so you can see how much offshore wind, for example, we're talking about. We're not saying we put it all there, it's obviously spread out, but that's the total area. And the amount we give energy costs. I think this is the one that surprises people the most, is just how much area would be taken up with energy crops if that was the way you were intending to go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I'll show on the on the track But as I say, it's online, you can play with it, you can download the Excel, you can download the code for this to repurpose it, and you can play the game. Let's go back. That's the game. Maya, how many of them time? Okay, see you. Okay, so that's the history and the campaign itself. Can I tell you a bit about what we've done with it? which is sort of the point. Um, well, it, it really helped, actually. Um, I mean, it's, it's, everyone know, everyone who's an expert already knows what the implications are in their particular sector. But this really helped bring it all together and, and really brought home to us the trade-off that we would need to make. Um, so it gave us a real understanding of just how big each energy supply sector is in terms of potential. So, for example, wave power compared to wind power. What really can we get from wave? Does it, does it make a difference? 
wind power, will it really make a difference, yes or no? Help us answer those questions. Um, um, so the, the most, this is going to sound silly, but one of the things that, if you use the calculator, most people will watch using the calculator, do the following thing. So I'll tell you so you don't have to. They start use, building renewable electricity. Let's have lots of wind power, let's have nuclear energy, not renewable per se, but it is low carbon. Um, let's have build, 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 build. But then it turns out that isn't enough, because of course, just producing lots of renewable electricity doesn't help, unless you actually stop using fossil fuels and electrify those sources of demand. So you have to have electric transport, you need electric heating to use the low carbon electricity that you produce. And that's sort of an insight for people that they hadn't thought of before. Um, and we see the impacts of the choices. So it helps us make an informed debate. Um, so broadly what we learned was um, most sectors are going to need to, to meet our targets. They'll need to be reasonably ambitious change. Back at the beginning, I said that we heard from people, it's very hard in my sector. What, what, you know, me, householder, it's very expensive to insulate my house. You know, someone else will have to do it. But the problem is that's true everywhere. And it's even expensive to not do anything at all. I mean, even if we don't do anything at all, we're still going to have to buy gas, or drill it out the ground, buy oil. It's still expensive. So it's not obvious if you just look narrowly at what you're trading. Um, as I say, we learned that we need to electrify transport, heating, and industry. Um, we do need bioenergy um, for those areas that you can't electrify. I mean, at the moment, you can't electrify planes. Um, I mean, there are electric planes, but they don't carry 100 passengers. So, okay, what are you going to do? Um, but it looks like fossil fuels will continue to play a role. Uh, plus, we won several awards, of which we're very proud. Uh, that's the Civil Service Awards. And we met the Queen, which we're also very proud of. Um, so, um, it turns out other countries are developing their own versions of our calculator for their particular circumstances. Um, so, uh, uh, Belgium, China has published. You can go online, look at the Chinese 2050 calculator, uh, South Korea. And these are all. Um, the government's either leading or heavily involved with the projects. Um, we've started calculators, we, we have some funding to help developing countries build their own calculator. Um, so we've started projects with South Africa, Brazil, um, and, and we're working with some others. So we have some experience in what it takes to convert, take our model and replace the bits that need to be replaced within individual countries, circumstances. And what we know about that, we will put on our website. So there's the Chinese calculator, which is in Chinese. <laughs> there is an option to switch back to English. Um, just wanted to prove that it, it really existed. Uh, we're also building a global calculator. So we have, a, again, a, a diverse uh, team, and they are building a version for the whole world, although not it's not that it's made up of a thousand different countries, it's, it's more simplified, but it covers the whole world, which means that since we're covering every mission in the world, we can look at the implications for temperature change, for global temperatures, um, and so we can feed that back. So that's still in development. Okay, this is my last slide, um, which is, I hope that some of you might be inspired, well certainly to look at our calculator, but also to repurpose it for your own needs. Um, if you would like to do that, everything that we know about building calculators is on this website, which as you can saw was the first hit in Google from 2050 Pathways Calculator. Um, we, we, you can find the Excel calculator and the web tool, the online version, a link to the source code for the online version. Um, so my colleague, uh, Dr. Council, has written software that takes Excel and converts it to uh, uh, an actual program, which is then compiled, which can then run on the web quickly. 
without having to use Excel, which is nice. There's a how-to guide, there's our original report looking at the output from the calculator, um, some advice and some presentations.